we're, we're going to get started here. So if I could get everybody to come on in and find a seat. We have people online ready to share our Zoom call. So please come on in and find your seat. We're going to get started in a minute. One minute. So. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Rivers Coalition meeting for uh, April. We've got a lot uh, going on on the agenda today, and we got some really great folks here in attendance with us, so we're excited about moving forward with that. We appreciate, again, the City of Stewart for uh, hosting us here, and I see Commissioner Matheson and Commissioner Bruner, and I'm not sure any other commissioners here with us. Hi. Oh, Heather, how are you? How are you? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of your support. Thank you also, Commissioner from Martin County. Uh, Stacy's here. Other, are there other commissioners, representatives that I missed or haven't missed? And also we have Lieutenant Colonel Polk here from the Corps of Engineers. Thank you for coming in person. We've had them on the call and we really, really appreciate their participation in these uh, meetings, as well as Jackie Thurow Lippish is governing board member for South Florida Water Management District. Thank you for coming. And of course, our special presentation today, unfortunately, um, Dr. Dwayne DeFries was um, sick and couldn't come and uh, today, but we have uh, Daniel uh, with us today to present that. But before we get that started, uh, I wanna ask you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and we'll get that going. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, you see that, all right. And uh, so as far as chairman's kind of comments or my thing going through the agenda, we, you know, there, there's a lot of great clean water out there, but it's giving us time to kind of assess what the resources are doing. Um, and we're doing a lot of oyster deployments and oyster uh, restoration work along with seagrass restoration work. Uh, there's been big initiatives by the state uh, to help fund some of the uh, restoration efforts, of course, in the Indian River Lagoon. And we're gonna hear some about that today. Um, and there's a lot going on, but uh, the Colonel's, I'm glad he's here today to help maybe update us um, about LOSUM along with Ben from the city of Stewart and others. So. Uh, we'll get into that as we move forward into the agenda. But I want to start out to uh, introduce uh, uh, Daniel. He's, uh, he's a graduate from uh, Florida Institute of Technology in uh, two, 2002. Um, Dan has been working in fisheries management for many, many years um, and witnessed a lot of drastic changes in the Indian River Lagoon, as we all recall some major fish kills that have happened up and down the lagoon. Uh, he was back at FIT in uh, 2015 and had his master's um, degree in science and environmental resource management. And for the next years, he worked with Brevard County uh, Natural Resources. And I think was Dwayne with that department as well back then? And in Brevard County, uh, Dwayne DeFries was with Endangered Lands. And they did a lot up there in Brevard County to really set aside some really uh, great properties. Then 2019, he joined the uh, Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. And as the uh, Chief Operating Officer and CFO there, he is currently manages all the grants and contracts, uh, which uh, the IRL NEP does a lot of funding throughout the whole lagoon um, and to a lot of agencies and groups that do a lot of great work. And um, he's an avid outdoorsman, sportsman, and regularly be found fishing in the Indian River Lagoon. So help me welcome Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Okay. All right, thank you, everybody. I appreciate you having me here this morning. I know you're all expecting Dwayne, and um, unfortunately, he was uh, completely lost his voice. So I'm going to try to fill his gigantic shoes. And as Mark said, I'm the COO and CFO for the IRL Council and the IRL NEP. And so today, I'm going to kind of uh, walk through this outline, just give you a little overview. Um, <clears throat> probably likely be a refresher for most of you on the overview history of the IRL and the issues it faces. Uh, then I'll describe 
uh, how an NEP operates, what its role in the ecosystem restoration is, and then finish up with some little things you can do. Sure. There we go. All righty. So the RL, as most of you know, is a complex system spanning three water bodies, the Mosquito Lagoon, Banana River, and Indian River. It's narrow, usually less than a mile across and very long, uh, 156 miles. It spans two climate zones, which leads to high diversity. It's shallow on average, less than four feet. And it's also poorly flushed with only five inlets uh, where none are included in Banana River. This lack of inlets makes the system microtidal and mostly wind-driven. Arrows become compartmentalized even further through bridge and causeways and construction, which leads to very high residence times. And so what goes in the lagoon tends to stay in the lagoon. And all these complexities make the system very vulnerable to changes. And so there are two types of stressors that have been uh, stressing the IRL and that, that they suffer from. Uh, the first one's the shocks and whoops. <clears throat> which are event stressors such as hurricanes, uh, wastewater treatment spills, and of course, uh, Lake Okeechobee discharges. Uh, chronic stressors um, are some such as litter and debris, invasive exotic species, <clears throat> uh, nitrogen input from mostly nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, different sources of toxicants such as PFOS, PFOA, internal cycling of nutrients from legacy loads and sediments, global climate change, specifically sea level rise, coastal acidification, and shoreline erosion. And lastly, watershed loss or alteration. And I want you to remember that last one and then take a look at these two photos uh, showing current aerials for Brevard County and Kennedy Space Center. And so this, this uh, the Northern Lagoon suffers from all these stressors that I just went over, except for Lake Okeechobee discharges. And one of the most significant alterations uh, in the northern area was this construction of the crawler way. And this really inhibited the flow from the Indian River into Banana River through Banana Creek. And so here's another example of some alteration. In uh, 1943, that aerial on the left is uh, Brevard County around Indian Harbor Beach and Silay Beach, and that one current one today. So you can see this profound uh, alteration of the landscape over the last 80 years. So this land use change has really led to all these chronic stressors and some of those shocks that I described. We're all probably familiar with this type of diagram and it shows how the system is responding today from all these dis different sources of input. The diagram is an excellent representation of primarily the Northern Lagoon suffering, but many of the same pollutants and sources also plague the South. In the South, uh, we're impacted by all those chronic stressors I mentioned, um, but unlike the Northern portion, Lake Okeechobee freshwater discharges, um, sometimes up to 9 billion gallons a day can shift the system to freshwater and make it vulnerable to toxic cyanobacteria blooms. And all these stressors for decades have shifted the system. Over the past decade, all these shocks and chronic stressors have fueled harmful algal blooms. And since 2011, there have been almost annually reoccurring blooms, and the system has shifted from a submerged aquatic vegetation regime or seagrass to a phytoplankton dominated system. And you can see the list of all these significant events here um, since 2011. Luckily, 2021 was a good year. Uh, there was no significant large blooms and water clarity has been uh, some of the best it's been in years. So it's all, is this all this work starting to make a difference? Uh, data-based modeling from St. John's River Water Management District in relation to the progress of the BMAP TMDLs uh, in respect to chlorophyll A may be suggesting that we are cautiously optimistic at this point. So even if water clarity continues, like we've seen over the last year, one of the greatest challenges will be habitat restoration. Knowing how seagrass growth rates occur from this past year during these clear years, will help us understand the time and scale needed to restore the uh, submerged aquatic vegetation in the system. This graph just shows what many of us know that once the bloom started in 2011, we have lost close to 90% of the seagrass uh, that was in the system. It's both a factor of uh, aerial extent and acres and the density of those acres. 
So not we're not only losing acres, but we're losing the density in those remaining acres. One thing of note, especially in the north, is the transition to macroalgae, which is helping to stabilize our sediments and maybe helping with this clear water. So Plurpa prolifera, to its name, is now prolific in many areas where seagrass once was. So now that I've, <clears throat> this loss of seagrass and shift to macroalgae has led to a chronic stress of, on manatees. And a lot of us are familiar with the UME that started in late 2020 uh, that triggered this uh, finding. The finding so far from this event has been uh, caused by starvation. So far in 2022, you can see the numbers there, uh, 488 dead, uh, which is less than last year's numbers at this point, uh, but still significantly above the average. So even though they have been feeding manatees up in uh, the power plant in Port St. John, uh, we're still seeing quite a loss. So now that I've kind of refreshed you and brought you up to speed on where the RL is and the issues it faces, I wanna talk a little bit about what an NEP is and what makes them unique. Uh, National Estuary Programs, which is NEP, uh, are non-regulatory. They're science-driven and consensus building programs authorized under section 320 of the Clean Water Act. The RL NEP is one of 28 in the whole nation. And you can see here on this map, um, designated as estuaries of national significance. And the NEP, <clears throat> focuses on responding to change, to a changing lagoon. Historically, the RLNEP was within the St. John's River Water Management District starting back in 1991. Um, since the change, it was <clears throat> reauthorized and restructured uh, to, <clears throat> to focus on these drastic changes that happened after 2011. So stakeholders throughout the lagoon region convened to create the IRL Council, a special district for the state of Florida with the sole purpose of hosting the IRL NEP. This restructuring has been significant and a little bit more on that later. Um, you can see here our vision, mis mission, promise, and goals since the restructuring. So the NEPs have specific authority under section 320 of the Clean Water Act. Uh, one of the most important is to convene this management conference. And the management conference is for the purpose of assessing water quality and trends, evaluating data, on many topics such as nutrients, uh, understand the relationships between in place and point and non point loads, develop a CCMP and uh, more on that later, and then help guide implementation of that said CCMP and align other programs with the CCMP. So this is kind of what the IRLNEP management structure looks like. It's uh, called network governance. It's a term from EPA. And it focuses on over 100 volunteers, which are made up of citizens, scientists, private sector professionals, and resource managers from multiple organizations and agencies throughout the IRL watershed. <clears throat> These volunteers convene among two advisory committees and a management board to inform and make recommendations to the IRL Council Board of Directors. And so this is just another example of what that model of network governance looks like. And it's uh, showing you how a six step process can lead to community change. And so as I showed earlier, the IRL encompasses a lot of different stakeholders um, and they have different jurisdictions, interests and or goals. The opportunity for network governance is getting the stakeholders to exchange ideas build relationships, explore options, identify common interests, and work together to solve problems of mutual interest. And we recognize that we cannot solve problems or issues by working alone. And so once we all determined to work together, uh, we have now convened the management conference, how do we solve these problems? Management conference over a three year period helped craft what I said earlier, a CCMP or a comprehensive conservation and management plan. And over 80 individuals with more than 750 comments uh, helped put this plan together. The health, the heart of this plan was identifying what issues or vital signs, and there's 32 in this vital signs wheel that all lead to a healthy lagoon. The water quality signs, habitats, and living resources make up the majority of the wheel. 
and uh, the one lagoon portion. Healthy communities are part of the one community portion and communicate, collaborate, coordinate are part of the one voice portion. Each vital sign has action plans that need to be taken in order to improve a health, towards a healthy lagoon. Each vital sign assigned a health level. And you can see the four of them there, level uh, one critical all the way down to level four stable. Uh, in the CCMP, it was identified six of those signs were uh, critical. So impaired waters, wastewater, stormwater, seagrasses, harmful algal blooms, and CCMP implementation and financing. On the right, you can see all the, the different vital signs and their uh, corresponding health concerns. None of them are considered stable or improving. However, just recently, we may be starting to turn the needle on uh, CCMP implementation and financing. So the Arrow Council receives funding from multiple sources and there's been incremental increases in federal appropriations the last few years. Uh, like I said, that one positive and starting to turn the ship has been funding through the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act, uh, which will bring uh, close to a million dollars over five years to the NEP. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that funding a little later on, on how we're planning to use it to help in restoration efforts. So for many of you, this may be the first time seeing the new art uh, for the specialty license plate. And it's one of our light, uh, revenue streams that comes in. Um, it's currently in the process with uh, Florida Highway Safety Motor Vehicles and is expected to be released uh, sometime in the fall. We hope this fresh new look will spark interest in sales to increase revenue. Of interest to you in the South IRL region here is that South Florida Water Management District uh, uses the revenue from Martin County, St. Lucie County, and Palm Beach County for a competitive grants program uh, to do restoration work in these those three counties. So what do we actually do in the RLNEP? Well, we help <clears throat> develop strategic plans to guide the implementation of that CCMP I mentioned earlier. And some of those documents are listed here. Uh, so the Climate Change Ready Estuary Report, which can help guide communities on taking actions uh, to become climate ready and resilient to climate change. Uh, we have a strategy for financing the CCMP. So we looked at how can we come up with uh, $5 billion, which was estimated to restore the entire lagoon. And this plan come, has different avenues to securing funding for all these different projects. We have a one lagoon monitoring plan, which is in uh, development right now, uh, should be out this fall for review, uh, which talks about what, what do we need to look at? What do we need to uh, monitor in the lagoon? And there's over 70 different types of monitoring uh, practitioners and stations that we've found so far throughout the lagoon. We have a one lagoon habitat restoration plan, which will help guide restoration efforts in the lagoon. It's gonna uh, be a tool for people as this, hopefully this clear water continues to be able to uh, plant seagrass and oysters and living shorelines. And then we have a communication plan on how do we get this message out that things are being done, that things are happening. Well, we have this annual report, which is on some of your chairs there. So we uh, go ahead and uh, share and track progress by other stakeholders. So you'll see in this report, it doesn't include just the projects that we're funding, but we actually gather data. And some of you in the room probably know that I send out a request every year for progress on projects so we can share that to everyone. <clears throat> so please feel free to take one of those annual reports. If not, you can find it on our website at onelagoon.org. So we also encourage and promote publication of scientific findings in peer reviewed journals and share scientific knowledge. So in just this past year, we used uh, grant funding to uh, do a special edition of the Frontiers of Marine Science uh, focused specifically on the 2011 super bloom. So science all from that event. We help cultivate and build a skilled workforce in community practice and habitat restoration and species recovery. And so when we think of success, you can see on the slide there that uh, normally we think it just goes straight. It takes a lot of hard effort uh, to finally learn what it takes to, to have a successful restoration effort. 
And that's important because as uh, we start really ramping up on seagrass restoration, it's gonna be really important to, to know what we need to do on that. We also fill gaps in our all monitoring network. So uh, harmful algal bloom monitoring has been going on for the last five years or so um, with contracts with the University of Florida and Florida Atlantic University at Harbor Branch. And they go out uh, to monthly or biweekly, I'm sorry, to several stations throughout the entire lagoon region, uh, taking water quality parameters, cell counts, and identifying any phytoplankton in the area. Um, we also monitor atmospheric depositions uh, of nutrients into the lagoon. And currently there's only one station, it's at Sebastian Inlet, uh, coming up in fiscal year 2023. We're gonna have two new stations. One's gonna be up near Kennedy Space Center and the other one's gonna be down here in Stewart. So we'll have a better idea of how nutrients are falling out of the atmosphere throughout the lagoon region. We also fund projects and you can see that in that annual report, uh, all the projects that we funded over the past year. Um, since 2015, when the IRL Council was restructured, uh, we have put $9.9 .9 million into uh, over 139 projects. And so each year we issue five competitive grants uh, for these project fundings, um, roughly about a million dollars a year in uh, water quality, habitat restoration, community engagement and restoration, science innovation, and small grants. We also provide technical assistance. So for any entity or stakeholder in the lagoon region that has a project, they wanted to, to do it, and they just don't know how to write a grant. They've identified the grant, just don't know how to write it. Um, we have three grant writers on service contracts that can provide assistance uh, at no cost to the grant proposal person. And here's some examples you can see on the left there of the successes. So, you know, the return on investment is, is significant for these types of uh, projects. We promote innovation, uh, encourage a new generation of in innovators and investors. So in 2018, we did this, what's called the Hack the IRL. It was like a 24 hour event um, with young, young professionals trying to determine and search out different types of technology that could be used on the lagoon to uh, accelerate restoration efforts. <clears throat> Uh, we work to improve data sharing, communication, and collaboration. And so in fiscal year 2021, we partnered with St. John's River Water Management District, FAU Harbor Branch, and a private company called Storm Center Communications, Inc. to showcase a, uh, the power of a spatial platform to bring uh, disparate data to a single map user interface across all different platforms for enhanced communication and collaboration in relation to harmful algal blooms. Just earlier this month, we completed several webinar sessions on how you might use this platform for emergency response scenario planning. We also communicate value and the need for action. So this, you can see is there's a link up there. Um, probably don't have time today, watch it, uh, but it's a, a call to action video. It's about five minutes long and it really kind of shows you um, everything I've talked to in just a prettier format. <laughs> Um, if you haven't seen it, I urge you all to uh, spend the five minutes to watch it. And such, so I already kind of touched on promoting communication, coordination, and collaboration. Um, but here's just another example of stakeholders working together for a common goal to restore uh, clan populations. And I know there's going to be uh, some talk tomorrow, um, an excellent clan workshop at Florida Oceanographic Society. And I know Mark's going to kind of talk to that a little bit later on today. Um, just wanted to mention some of these successes here. <clears throat> um, as we go forward, you know, you saw that infrastructure funding coming in. Uh, we're going to be putting a significant amount of that into seagrass restoration capacity. So with the goal of as this clean water continues or hopefully continues, uh, we're going to build capacity to actually replant seagrass we don't know uh, what the rates of recovery are since there's so little seed uh, root stock out there. And so wrapping up, I just want to you know put what you can do. Um, I know this is just a list of 10 words that all start with the, word, the letter R, um, but they're the basis for actions that you can take. 
So like reduce your fertilizer use or restore native vegetation along the shoreline or report violations or take responsibility or build resilience in your community. Um, we have begun a campaign to produce short videos and infographics uh, regarding that drill down to each of these 10 R's at multiple different levels. And so all that media is, uh, can be found on our website at onelagoon.org. And we're gonna be producing even more throughout the rest of this year and into the future. And so we encourage uh, folks to go ahead and, and go on there and they can share those videos and use them as they like. Um, and so that we can all make a push for that one community, one voice, one lagoon mantra, and we'll all work together towards a healthy lagoon. Thank you. Do I have questions or? Uh, right now it's wet and dry deposition for nitrogen um, and phosphorus. And so it's, uh, there's a huge network run through EPA called CastNet. And we have a contractor on a service contract, uh, wood environmental infrastructure uh, and, and solutions. And they go out and, and collect the samples and so process them. Yeah, so uh, initial results, you know, for our county has a great infographic to show all the different sources over multiple years, you know, what was the biggest input of nutrients to the system? Oh. Years ago, it was all wastewater treatment, you know, and that's slowly shifted as we've made those fixes to um, the wastewater treatment um, plants and oh, the legacy load nutrient flux really come up. And then uh, what we didn't know was nutrient deposition is a huge factor. So with all the industrial and all the people moving into the area, all the automobiles, it's actually raining nutrients on the lagoon. So it is a significant impact. Mm -hmm. One more deal. The all lines of the 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 dock, so we can't take up much more than really the bow line. All right. Well, I just take it off and it is yes. important variable because there's not a science uh, out there to support, you know, does it or does it not? So, you know, I don't want to jump the gun, but our NEP is looking at funding an herbicide study a couple of years from now. Significant. Um, we also have a couple of grants in proposal stage right now. They're they're not ready to be funded. It's still got to go through. The it's, it's possible. So the way we operate is we have to do competitive grants or competitive procurement. So we would actually, you know, come up with a, a project that we want to see and then put that out for proposals uh, from different organizations or different entities to do that study. And so that's how we would uh, partner with this part aspect. But we do see it as a potential. The whole lagoon, yes. In some areas, yes. So how the way they do the seagrass monitoring mapping is they fly transects over the lagoon when it's clear, usually in the spring or, or winter time. And so Lori Morris at St. John's, who works also with South Florida to do all those transects and compile it all into a database, 
it's pretty neat. Um, I saw it last week at the Harbor Ranch Symposium. Uh, it shows all those transects from 2009 through current, and it shows how much seagrass was in there. And you can see certain areas are staying steady of those transects. Others are really compartmental. Some areas are really do hanging on, others not so well. It's an average over the entire lagoon system. So, so yeah, like I said, some areas may be doing much better than others. You know, there are, are some spotty areas that are holding their own. So we hope, yeah, yeah. But it, it's the different types of change. So, you know, how often Johnson's eye is really taking a hit in some areas and other areas it's doing fine. So each each different species is doing differently as well. That's a good question. Um, I know Harbor Ranch and Orca have some monitoring stations in the lagoon right in those areas. So um, I personally don't know the data, but I would I would think that would be a good thing to look at and see if there's any trends regarding that. Um, I know St. Lucie County, uh, our one of our chair, uh, Chris Sadowski, he's looking at trying to get that whole wastewater treatment plant off there into a different area. So we're working on trying to get rid of it. It's a great question. I would think that the dynamics of these compartments are really the key to um, how seagrass, hand, you know, thrives in those areas or doesn't thrive. Um, you know, because it, I just saw a great study last week. Um, they put these little floating balls to show the model of how water just circulates, especially with the causeways. It just keeps circulating the same area for, for you know, months, years in some areas. Uh, so things that go in the water there just stay there. They don't they don't move out. So you could see both. You could see the conditions that uh, are on algal bloom happens, it shades it out, seagrass dies. You could see some that are been so sub, uh, submitted to these types of stressors that they're starting to become resistant. You know, and with the clams, that's one thing we saw. That these clams that were found afterwards are somewhat resistant to harmful algal blooms. They they can kind of eat the Oreo umbra a little bit, but there's like a mucus on the Oreo umbra that keeps it from being digestible for most clams, and that's why they were dying. Um, so having this, these genetic diversity could be the key to restoration. And I know Mark at FOS with seagrass is doing genetic testing and diversity testing. So there's some potential there for finding resistant strains of seagrass that can handle maybe some lower light conditions or something along those lines. So good question. Yeah, Calerpa is, it's, could be a problem or it could be a solution. And depending on what, how you look at it, um, Calerpa looks like seagrass at first glance, um, but it's a macroalgae. It's not a true grass. Um, it does root and grow very similar to seagrass, 
a, it does provide some type of habitat, but its nutritional value is nowhere close to uh, seagrass. It doesn't cycle nutrients or oxygen as quick as seagrass does. It does not, um, it also is not as tolerant to some of the conditions. So when it gets hot, it dies. And so you can see that, that um, all those nutrients that were, became a sink you know, go back out and become a source for potential uh, phytoplankton. One thing is uh, Calerpa is also good at pushing seagrass out. So if it gets in there really good, it can actually, if seagrass is trying to come back, it can push it out. So there's some benefit, it holds the sediment together very well. So I've seen in some areas of the lagoon, you know, especially with the wind we've had, it just crystal clear, even with it blowing windy, you know, right behind the clerp, it's still flat, calm, totally clear. So there is some benefit to it. I think, um, you know, until we, we start re getting seagrass back in the ground and, and it really starts to expand, clerpa could be, you know, helpful at this point. Excuse me, I'm, I need to ask you to please um, repeat everything somebody says in the, audience and on the board because we cannot hear it. Yeah, so Calerpa has like a brighter green, almost neon -y green color, um, but they also do ground truthing. So they will go out there and say, yeah, I think it looks like, you know, it, it seagrass or maybe it's Calerpa. And so if, if they have any questions, they do ground truth it as well. Get in the water, yeah. I mean, we have, um, you know, the majority of what we do is, like I said, we, we, we get proposals in from entities. And so there have been buffered shoreline uh, proposals. There have been living shoreline proposals from entities that have been funded. And so, um, you know, what we're planning to do this upcoming year, too, is really showcase a lot of these projects that we've done, um, not just in those, these books, these annual reports, but actually on the website, making them interactive. So you can actually click on it and get information on, you know, the annual, your final report, what happened, how, you know, get all the information regarding that project. So it could help, um, you know, potential homeowners use it as a tool. Towards Oh, oh, yeah, without. 
Diane, are you ready to uh, give your report uh, for Martin County? Then we'll go City of Stewart and South Florida order. Thanks, Mark. Okie dokie. Greetings, everyone. Diane Hughes with uh, Martin County uh, Public Works Ecosystem Restoration and Management Division. Hold it closer. Okay, gotcha. So just want to give you a look at what's going on with Lake Okeechobee and what we've got going on with the estuary here today. Uh, Lake is at 13.04 feet. Um, today, I pulled this information today. You can see how much is still coming into the lake up at the top there. I don't know if this is, is this a button? Yeah, right there. So 1600 CFS is coming into the lake from the Kissimmee region. And it looks like they're trying to send as much as they can south here and uh, to the to the West Caloosahatchee. This is the time of year in the dry season when they do want some water going down there. Oh, wow. Our salinity levels here in uh, March towards uh, April have been coming up to where we need them to be. And um, that's where we like them to be good for oyster spawning and everything this time of year. These are the air and enterococcus levels, uh, fecal coliform, if anyone doesn't know what enterococcus means. Um, we're looking um, pretty good. Oops, see, oops. A um, little bit around the middle estuary is, uh, wasn't good in the uh, moderate region. Um, the causeway, just speak, Causeway was in a good range, but uh, the Stewart Causeway was in a poor range, so I don't know what was uh, going on in that area. And these were samples that were taken on April 25th, so just a couple of days ago. Here's a seasonal precipitation, precipitation outlook. Um, this was from the periodic scientist call that um, happened the other day, which unfortunately I was not able to attend. And it's uh, above, oops, keep hitting the wrong button, above normal for precipitation coming our way here in Florida. Um, I probably can't answer any questions about that. <laughs> okay, all right. And these are just general comments. We, it looks like the lake is coming down at one foot per month recession rate, which is, looks good for us hitting the 12 foot by June. Um, active hurricane season coming up for us. Um, we've had some trend in wetter conditions and our recommendation to the Army Corps of Engineers was to send as much water south and west for beneficial use and to get the lake at a level that encourages more SAV regrowth and reduces the likelihood of harmful discharges. And I already talked about the um, oyster spawn uh, that we'd like to see these levels, salinity levels stay where they are right now. Um, that's all I have. Top one first, look at the bottom. Thanks. Sure, John. Salinity levels? Bacteria levels. Get out of here. The question is, do the enterococcus levels are higher when we have a freshwater lens and do they decrease when we have more of a saltwater lens? And that might be a question for the Department of Health. <laughs> I, 
Yeah. No one can hear you, Mark. Excellent. Excellent. Good question. All right. We got uh, City of Stewart um, with low some updates too with Ben. Ben, come on down. City of Stewart's been phenomenal here. Thanks, Mark. Um, actually, nothing to present today, just to um, remind everyone that on Monday, the City of Stewart Commission uh, adopted a resolution in support of a U.S. House resolution that uh, Congressman Mast. Uh, presented um, and had a, had a whole uh, joint conference here by the river uh, last week. Um, we, we drafted as quickly as we could. The resolution that he drafted basically would create a new plan at the federal level, um, which he designated as NERP, NERP, which is uh, Northern Estuaries Restoration Plan. It would uh, complement, I think, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan because in SERP right now, only about two thirds of the uh, discharges to the estuaries are, are estimated to, to be uh, in some way removed or eliminated or mitigated. And that's obviously not enough for us. So we want that to be 100%. This new plan that would be drafted at the federal level um, would guide the Army Corps, the district, the state itself uh, to ensure that we create projects that do that. So that's something obviously we support. Um, we put that in as soon as we could. Uh, we encourage it support. Um, and we certainly encourage the Army Corps to, um, to engage with us any time in conversation about that uh, and how we can get the projects even on the books for, for SERP um, to limit as many discharges to us as possible. Uh, with the weather outlook, I would just add that our position is uh, very similar, identical to Martin County. Um, right now, we do recognize that it, it's a La Nina, uh, an unexpected extended La Nina event. Um, so as a result, there's gonna be drier conditions potentially uh, in, in, in warmer conditions. But when we looked at the, and I'm looking at Colonel Polk when I say this, when we looked at the hurricane outlook for this year, it might be the seventh year in a row that we could have uh, a greater than average storm season. So that's something that we want to always reiterate to the Army Corps and to, to the South Florida Water Management District, that just because the outlook um, is warm right now doesn't mean that there's not a lot of water coming. And that's what we're I is always on. So other than that, um, I think, good, Mark. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks. We'll, we'll get a we'll get an update on Losum after after uh, the water management district. So Jackie, would you give us uh, updates? Here you go. Hi everybody, Jackie Thurlow Lippish um, for the South Florida Water Management District. Uh, off the bat, uh, Governor DeSantis has not seen any bills yet that could be affecting us and the South Florida Water Management District. So we're just waiting and uh, that's the way it goes. Uh, here on the home front, um, my husband and I, I have made sure that he has, I'm not in this little plane, that he's flying and taking pictures of the St. Lucie River, Indian River Lagoon. And he's been really good in April. We have like three different shots and um, it's really something to see how pretty it looks close to the St. Lucie Inlet. Of course, that's not the whole case, you know, at deep into the forks of the St. Lucie River or up north in the Indian River Lagoon. But boy, when you see the potential of how it can look down here, it, it is stunning. You can also see that there is no seagrass and that those are just uh, desert-like sandbars that are out there. And so obviously uh, that is of, of great concern. Um, Let's see, April 11th, I believe there was um, an, a warning from the health department for blue-green algae uh, in C44 Canal and also at Port Mayaka. Um, I'm sorry, I was gonna say Drew. Drew is not my husband. Ed in the airplane uh, did not see any of that algae, you know, and I asked him to really look. So I'm sure it's in the water but it hasn't built up so much that it's like lining against the edges. You, you might remember that last April, we were in full bloom by this time in the lake. You know, so um, it's very interesting to see what's going to happen or not happen this year. Um, we had our governing board meeting on April 14th, and um, it was a pretty 
you know, non-controversial meeting. Uh, the main thing that we went over was water conservation. We uh, put forth uh, that as our main uh, objective and uh, put forth a resolution. And it's ironic that we put forth water conservation in a state that has totally drained itself dry with the Central and South Florida plan of all of our canals. Nonetheless, this is the world we have created. And so we must conserve water. Uh, one of the things that has happened over the past few years that I'm very proud of with the South Florida Water Management District and particularly my peers on the governing board, they have pushed all the counties in the 16 uh, county area that are part of the South Florida Water Management District to accept a water conservation, to watering two days a week. As you probably know, 60% of water that is used for consumptive use for just people living in residential neighborhoods is for people's sprinklers. What a waste. That's just, dis just disgusting. It really is. And so Martin County was slow, but Martin County did agree. And there's only a few counties that haven't agreed. The issue is that it's, very, it's almost non-enforceable. You know what I mean? How do you enforce that? Do you like have cops driving around looking for people with their sprinklers on at night? I mean, maybe that's what you need, but that's not going to happen. And so like with everything that we're talking about here, it's not just money. It's not just government. It's cultural. We have to have a cultural shift in people to recognize that they have to only, that it's, we should only water twice a week. And if we don't, we should um, think about our habits and see if we can change it. And uh, the district is also doing something I know it didn't want to do because it didn't want to enter it. You know, they didn't want to like tell people what plants to put in their yards, but now on their conservation resolution, it's talking about native plants and Florida friendly plants. That's an easy way to improve these things. And these are all things that, um, you know, it, it can't just be the people. It has to be the culture of these agencies and it has to be the culture of our legislature, which it hasn't quite gotten to yet. And it has to be the culture, not just of one governor, but of every governor that comes um, into our state. The other thing I wanted to mention, because it is in Martin County, and it does not get enough attention because I'm not paying attention to it, which is wrong, but I'm always thinking about the St. Lucie, the Loxahatchee. Okay, the Loxahatchee is a beautiful river. It's a, it's one, it was the first wild and scenic river. It's only of two in the state of Florida. The late Nat Reed, I mean, had so much to do with it becoming a wild and scenic river, has the exact opposite problem we have. It doesn't get enough water. That river used to be totally connected to the Everglades. They built it, they drained it, they did terrible things to it. Now they're trying to bring more fresh water back. And so the South Florida Water Management job is to do what's called water reservations. And if you, if, if that sounds like nothing, I'm telling you that's war. When you go to set those water reservations, all the water users, agriculture in particular, is often very angry and fighting against you because they want the water or, you know, or new developers want the water. They don't want to give it to the river. The river doesn't have a voice. We're the only voice for the river. So the WERDA bill uh, two years ago, or most recently, um, put Loxahatchee finally in a place where it can get water reservations and will start being um, improved as well. So um, I think that's it. I did just want to say that, um, you know, unfortunately, the way things are set up, one person, in the, the, the way it is now, one place or one person wins and another place and another person loses. It's, it's a bummer. It's the way it's set up. So right now, with like kind of dry, drought conditions, the St. Lucie's looking pretty good. You know, at, my husband's flying over and I'm like, yay, look at this. This is awesome. Look, at, this is great. But when I hear um, Drew Bartlett, who is our um, executive director of the governing board, talking about what's happening in water conservation area three, which is why it's kind of like below the EAA, they are dry and it is so dry that they, their fires can, you know, ignite the poor birds that had like one of the best rookeries in the whole world 
they can't go there this year or they're only on the edge because it's so dry. And my question at the last governing board meeting, I was like, you know, is this a direct thing because the water coming south of the lake is going to the EAA and it's getting used up by the farmers in the EAA, but it's not going south and, you know, it's not that easy, but there's certainly a correlation. And the bottom line here is we have to always remember we're part of a greater system. So like if you see a bird fly by, it might be living somewhere else, but just come here to eat. And I care deeply about all of God's creatures, all of the animals. It's not just about us. And so as we fix things, let's please try to think about fixing it for not just us, but for everybody and for every creature. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. We sure appreciate her being here and giving us updates. That that governing board meeting on April 14th was a really good focus on, as Jackie said, on uh, water conservation. And we pointed out there too that, you know, we only get about 53.2 inches of rainfall on an average each year in the district. And that rainfall has to recharge our shallow aquifers, primarily what we use for drinking water, as well as the lower aquifers, which are now using more of in the Florida aquifer as we pump that up and put it through reverse osmosis for potable water. But um, I indicated there that too is important for water conservation are these projects that we're building like stormwater treatment areas and retention areas and everything in order to get that those wetlands rehydrated and rehydrate the wetlands, which are the recharge for those aquifers in our and we've kind of lost a lot of that. And we're dumping about, as Jackie said, all the canals in the central and south Florida system are dumping about 1.7 billion gallons a day to the Atlantic Ocean or Gulf of Mexico. And all that fresh water going to the Atlantic or Gulf at 1.7 billion is more than we consume in South Florida. Our eight, eight and a half million people consume about 1.3 billion gallons a day. So literally we're dumping more water to the ocean, fresh water that should be going south and, and rehydrating our wetlands, storage treatment, you know, in those areas that we're trying to build. So as much about water conservation as don't sprinkle your yard is, is all these big projects we're trying to do to store and treat that water, not just run it off a canal and run it out. The other thing she mentioned too was important to know that as you saw, Diane put up the, the graph and show where the water is coming into the lake and going out. We got about 800 uh, CFS come to the St. Lucie Canal, but it's not going through the S80 structure into the estuary. That water from the lake goes into the canal and is used for irrigation. The same on the kind of west coast, only more so about 1300 CFS is going to the west of Clusachi, and it goes all the way down, but it's kind of rehydrating that watershed which normally would get it, but they over dredged it back in the 1900s when they dredged the Clusahatchee. What's going south is about 1500 CFS right now, but as Jackie mentioned, it's being pulled up for irrigation in the Everglades agricultural area. So consequently, none of that goes through the STAs and down to the Everglades that needs it. So water conservation area in the Everglades is about you know, almost a foot or so below its normal schedule, and it's very dry, and that can have real consequences for that. So when you ever hear us about in, during the dry season, the Everglades needs that water flow, we need to try to revise the system so that we're actually putting more water down south in there for storage. Oh yeah, I saw that in the news this morning. <laughs> yep, fine. Yep. Because we have a lot of people who own homes that are only snowbirds. That's right. Be out driving, it's pouring rain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're not here. Well, it's it. The question about is how do you how do you police or how do you enforce kind of watering efforts when the automatic sprinklers are going off and it should be, they should have rain sensors on them and to number one to stop that from doing. Uh, there's got to be a big push to enforce those kind of things. And when the water district does get into those restrictions, they've got to send out enforcement because exactly what you're saying happens. You, you go by and it's raining or something and their sprinklers are going off. In California, it's real critical. In fact, turning on the tap, I read and saw this news this morning that 
they'll even fine you for, for using water out of turn kind of thing. They're having to really regulate water. And, and remember, California has different water laws than we do. It literally is wars because it's like privatized water systems. Here in Florida, we're under public water system use. So the district and other public agencies kind of govern the management of that water. So we really appreciate staying that way and not privatizing the water here and there. And that whenever that starts happening, look out because Florida's, you know, the water state and we're going to get in real trouble. Um, we'd like to go to Colonel Polk. I think the state federal agency is well represented here by the Colonel and ask you to give us uh, as part of your report, maybe a little update on LOSUM, if you would. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, great to be here. Great. Good afternoon. We find it the afternoon mark and um, boy, so much to hit about so many great things. Maybe I can add a little color to, to Diane and, and Ben and, and Mr. Olipish there to what, what y'all discussed. Great points all around and think things that I was going to talk about in one way, shape, or form or the other. Real quick, just a quick update from, so from my boss in Jacksonville, Colonel Jamie Booth, he's up in DC right now. Uh, he and along with General Kelly, the South Atlantic District uh, Division Commander, they're up in DC walking halls of Congress. In fact, met with the Congressman Mass yesterday, uh, continue to pound pound and knock on doors up there to talk about our concerns and listen to other concerns, of course. Um, from the Fledger, the Florida delegation and others. Uh, so it's always a good thing. I mean, that's, as, as you're all well aware, we've got about 1.5 billion coming in from this last year's appropriations, the 1.1 out of the IIJA, the 450 million out of the presidential budget. And of course the C23, C24 being the big winner in that, as well as we talk about Loxahatchee River. I couldn't be more excited about, you know, um, as Ms. Thurlopich said, you know, that water reservation, that's important, right? That is the water for the environment. And that's what we're, that's what'll be protected uh, this later on this summer, we hope to enter the pre-partnership credit agreement, which is very important because that's that ledger, that cost share ledger that, that allows South Florida to start work on it, the state to work on it. And then we, uh, it's, it's a 50-50 cost share, so that all will, will count in crediting. Uh, and so very important on that. Uh, on the lake real quick, I'll, I'll go back on the lake. So as Dan said, great, great points all around. I think the things I'll highlight, so the evapotranspiration, very high right now. We're, we're, we're dropping just ET alone is about one... 0.2 inches a week. Um, and then that's important to know. So the, you know, there's really nothing we can do when it comes to, you know, you talk to Audubon and our friends at Fish and Wildlife, that sets a pretty significant rate for the snail kite nesting. So we were looking pretty good early on, but, but when you're dropping that low that fast, uh, again, it, nature's in control this time of year, not a whole lot we can do whenever, if, if we were trying to hold water or not, it, it's, there's not much we can do to try and slow that recession rate down. Uh, in a real significant way. Um, I think as you saw, so we are releasing some water from the 308, uh, for, primarily for navigation, you said, and, and for irrigation purposes, uh, not, not sending that through the um, S80 and no intent to do that out of the, uh, the St. Lucie Lock and Dam. Uh, again, the C44, the reservoir is looking good. It's, it's, we're holding about 10 feet right now, maintaining just, just for this operational testing phase in the most dangerous time. Uh, that you can have when you're when you're filling up a new structure like that. Fortunately, everything on the structural uh, dam safety ratings is coming out great. Uh, we are keeping some close eyes and monitoring um, on the hydrology of the wells on some nearby areas. As you can imagine, you put that much water now in a big swimming above ground swimming pool, and it does have some shifts and changes in what the what it's doing to the groundwater in there. So that's so we're going to probably hold it there for a little bit longer. But but things are looking well, and, and the intent will be to always to try and you know lower that pool if you will, so we can hopefully fill it up a little bit as we hit the wet season. So, um, but, but right now holding it right up there, that 10 foot level, uh, what else? Uh, algae. Yeah. So what we're seeing in the algae um, from the periodic scientific call and, and as she sowed there, um, you know, so the North and the Northwest, uh, portions of the lake are, are seeing the algal blooms right now and tracking. There was a algal bloom. Um, there was a detection of cyanobacteria at the S 79, the, the Franklin structure on the uh, C 43 side recently, or I think just a few days ago. Um, but you know, we're doing all we can. We, we know it's coming. We get us that time of year. We do every thing we can. I would say one of the, the great things that we're doing with partnering that we're just kicking off. Um, so South Florida Water Management District under uh, Lawrence Glenn's team, they, they have a new app out now. And it's really for anyone to, to, to how they can. It's kind of that detection potential, algal bloom potential app is what it is. And it's, it's the same thing. So all of our lock operators and South Florida team will use this as we do our daily pictures at the locks and everywhere we see what, you know, hey, how's it looking? Uh, and what's great is I'll go right into South Florida's team. Um, again, something we're all going to use and be on the, on the same sheet of music. Uh, and, and it's exciting in that just, hey, we're doing this common sense, th common sense things, um, you know, to, to move us all forward and speak the same language. 
uh, as we look at, at the potential of algae in the, as that can continue throughout the summer. Um, what else here? Couple thing. Um, yeah, did. And uh, so I think the next thing, yeah, I'll just, I'll just kind of low sum. So, you know, continuing, so the environmental impacts, that, that's where we're at right now. So we're writing an environmental impact statement. Um, great thing is a lot of engagement. <laughs> the bad thing from a writing perspective, a lot of engagement, right? So, it, and what I mean is there are thousands of comments that have to all be addressed um, in, in order for a lot. You have to go back to, to, write, to write the operational plan that we're in the middle of doing before we can kind of go back out and release that operational draft plan we've really got to incorporate those comments and take a hard look at it. I mean, for, for a multitude of reasons of making sure we're addressing it for legal sufficiency down the road, just, just, it, it takes a lot of time. So that, that plan is coming along. Um, I would tell you, we will have, uh, again, the, the draft water control plans out in, in a month or so. Um, and, but, but I think is, is most importantly, we'll, we'll have that low sum up and online as the Herbert Hoover Dyke um, rehabilitation continues or, and, and it will conclude here in the winter time. So I think we're staying on track with that. And when we look at the big picture, the amount of money and, and things that have been spent on the dike, it's come along splendidly, uh, especially when you look at, you know, all the, the logistic supply chain problems we've had over the past two years and, and even to, uh, you know, they're bringing operators in and out of the country for certain very specific equipment um, for those, for some of those things over from Germany or Italy, you know, just a host of, a host of things that have thrown on there. Uh, that everything they could to you know slow it down, but we're really sticking close to that schedule, and that's important. Um, and really, I think that's yeah, the really bit it. Uh, just like I said, the, um, you know, we're always listening to our legislators and excited. You know, anything new that will bring us more work and, and more things to do to restore the environment, we're all about it. So we're excited. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so so good to have have him represented here, and um, you know, Los is is moving forward. We're looking forward. They're doing the environmental impact statement review from April through July. So, in in this time period, as the colonel said, we're looking to see that draft operational water control plan come out. Uh, that'll be a time I think public needs to get engaged. So, hopefully, we'll get if we get notices on that. We'll put them through the website at Rivers Coalition and others to try to get the word out to attend those kind of things. Um, as as far as really appreciate the the updates too on C44. Many of us out there at C44 projects started to see it get filled up. Uh, once that reservoir is filled up, I, I know that they start to bleed it out through the STAs and then back to the system. Will any of that be used for irrigation needs or or things in the basin at this time, or do you know? once it right it can be used for that that so that's important to know that 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 c44 reservoir sta uh, system out there can be used and so they don't have to depend on let's say lake water to come in and use that for their irrigation needs in the canal level because there are about 25 pump stations along that canal that draw water out of that for basically consumptive use on mostly um, agricultural lands in that 116,000 acre um, C44 basin around the canal. Um, so great, thank you very much again, appreciate it. I don't know if anybody from FDEP or FWC is here, but we certainly encourage them to come and give us some updates. Um, um, Lake Okeechobee update, Paul Gray usually comes. I didn't see him here today. Oh, Paul, you're on Zoom, great. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Paul Gray, can, you hear, can, can you hear we me? hear you? Can you hear me? Paul Gray, oh. are you there? <laughs> you can't hear me. Unmute Paul Gray. There's Paul. We can see you. Yeah, but you can't hear me. We got to unmute you. I can you, hear though. you. We can't can hear you. Hear, I can hear Paul Gray. Can you unmute? Only people on Zoom can hear me. Oh, shoot. Mm. Some reason we can't hear you. <laughs> He was waving at us. Is there, we want to keep trying. Oh, uh, okay. Well. Can we see Paul? Can we hear Paul? Paul. Oh, well, he's trying. 
Hey, Todd, are you managing Zoom? Can you kind of give him unmute or unmute him if Todd's on? Oh, there we go. He put some comments in the chat, looks like, or no worries. Lake is dropping quickly, which is a problem for nesting birds, but allows for levels to help S SAVs, submerged aquatic vegetation. So that's a good thing, huh? Great, Paul. <laughs> hey, that's okay. We'll, we'll get around this any way we can. So appreciate your, uh, your being involved and engaged out there. Thanks so much. So, um, you know, he'll, he typed another marriage, no worries. Sorry, he couldn't be here today. All right. Thanks, Paul. We'll check in later. Um, let's go to local uh, kind of those issues of dealing with state and federal legislation. Uh, we wanted to talk about um, that HR 7520, which is that bill that's been mentioned about the city of Stewart supported from Representative Mass introduced it right out here on the boardwalk on April 13. What encourages me about this uh, legislation is that it requires the core to really focus in on the north, northern estuaries, uh, you know, restoration plan, including Lake Okeechobee watershed. So it, it really uh, highlights not only the, you know, during that planning portion of it to look at, have the Secretary of the Army really look into how we can reduce the, or eliminate the discharges, but also the toxic algae blooms, rehydration of the, um, the watersheds and also the water quality issues, which to me is one of the first times that the Corps is to really start to address the water quality issues in, the, in this uh, kind of planning process, um, rather than just leaving it up to the state. So they're gonna coordinate with the state on addressing those and integrating with other activities, which means that it won't take away from the LOSUM uh, activities or the, the Comprehensive Everglades plan, which is all the other uh, projects and programs that you know in the integrated delivery schedule, which are going on. It won't, it won't take away from that. There have been some concern. A lot of people said, well, this is going to just take away from that bill, but I don't think it will. So it's, it's real encouraging. Um, there are going to be, a, this is going forward through, he is on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee in the House. Uh, that has a subcommittee on water uh, issues that, that he's a part of too. So goes through those committee levels and he's looking to try to put this in a part of the WERDA. Remember the Water Resource Development Act? That's up for every two years. So this 2022 WERDA Act is what Congress is working on right now. And I just want to mention too, the funding that the Colonel mentioned is, is really good this year uh, for all the core projects and things going forward. But it's also looking good as the president puts forward their budget. We are encouraging him to hold fast to a very high level of funding for Everglades restoration and other projects. So turn it over to Eve for any other updates, maybe on House Bill 2508 or something. Read my mind, Mark. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to focus on one bill that I think is central to the mission of the Rivers Coalition. That's Senate Bill 2508. This was an extremely bad piece of environmental legislation that was filed in February on a Friday afternoon, kind of a sneak attack. It included a number of bad provisions, including um, enshrining into state law water shortage rules that govern uh, when the environment can get deliveries and when agriculture can get deliveries and protecting the status quo in essence. The bill was amended um, to remove some of the um, toughest restrictions on, on updating those rules. However, it remains concerning. Um, so we, uh, Friends of the Everglades, have sent a veto request to the governor, along with Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, Conservancy of Southwest Florida, Calusa Waterkeeper. I know Florida Oceanographic also has sent a veto request. Is that right, Mark? Um, and so if you haven't filled out a, a letter, a message to the governor asking him to veto this bill, please do. You can go to FOS's website. You can go to everglades.org. It's right there on the homepage. Take two minutes and send a message. If you want to get extra credit and go above and beyond, please call the governor's office and tell them you're really concerned about this bill. Some people are out there saying, oh, there's a few good things in this bill. That's wrong. There's nothing good for the environment in this bill. I won't go into the details now. If you want to know more, come talk to me after or talk to Mark or go to our website. Um, but there are a number of concerning provisions. This isn't a water bill. It's an anti-water 
water bill. So please help us out on this front. It's really important, especially as we're talking about a new, more flexible and balanced Losum lake plan. We need to have the best rules on the books to allow flexibility to manage the lake during those water shortage periods or approaching drought. Um, and then that's that's kind of the bad news. And of course, we're hopeful the governor will veto it. One more thing I'll say about 2508 is um, the governor has until June 30th to either sign it, veto it, or let it become law without his signature. It has not been officially transmitted to his desk yet. So we have potentially two months. It could happen faster, but time is of the essence. Um, finally, I just want to hit a positive note here in our Martin County community. It's not directly related to the Rivers Coalition, um, but it certainly impacts water. A week ago at the Martin County Commission meeting, a majority of commissioners voted against the Rural Lifestyles Amendment that could have opened up tens of thousands, potentially more than 100,000 acres to development. So if you see commissioners Heard, Campy, and Hetherington, please thank them for voting the right way on that. This isn't the end of it. Um, the uh, proposal for a smaller footprint of development is likely to come back um, for about 1,500 acres, but we as a community killed the worst of it, and I think we should be proud of that. That's it for me. Thank you. Really appreciate those updates. And there were some not so good bills too that went through like Senate Bill 1000 had to do with uh, rate tailoring for fertilizer applications and stuff. But that 2508 is still in pending. So I echo that same thing. Make sure you get to the governor and ask him to veto that when it hits his desk, um, which he's doing right now. He's looking at all kinds of bills and signing them in. So. Um, Stay tuned for the next uh, legislative session too. And don't forget, this is an election year. Um, get with Gil Smart um, and vote water, uh, particularly about candidates who are coming up to uh, propose their platforms and what they do. Uh, we've talked about it as a board of the Rivers Coalition of maybe doing a forum or something, but we'll stay tuned for that because there may be other areas where we can kind of introduce candidates and drill them down and, and I'll let Gil um, kind of work on that. and. Let's work through vote water. Uh, he's and they're the one that five one four organization that can really help us kind of understand candidates, what they're going to do, what they're going to provide, and make sure we hold them to task um, in those um, initial areas leading up to the elections. Uh, Rivers Coalition committee updates. River Kids and is Nick Mater on or was she available? No, she didn't. They had a real great manatee. Uh, you know, thing at the Lyric Theater, which was really great to see Pat Rose and others and FWC folks there. So it was a, a really good event. And I'm sure the River Kids are doing amazing work. I mean, I see the original River Kids there just recently, and they're all grown up and and they're still advocates for the water. It's a really great thing So to see. Um, Speakers Bureau, we've got uh, uh, Todd here. I'm Todd Weising. I'm the coordinator of the uh, Speakers Bureau. And what our job is, is to take our message out to the public uh, for anyone that has meetings. Um, last couple of years, COVID has, has restricted our ability to get out. But we do Zoom, we do in-person meetings. Um, also a clean river, that's a wonderful thing. As Jackie said, you fly over or you're in your boat, it's a wonderful thing. But think about all the other items that we've talked about in this meeting that everyone should know about and we need to have a population that's educated we have an election coming up and we need advocates out there so please see me after the meeting or go on the rivers coalition website and click um, request a speaker thank you yeah, and Todd and I had talked earlier about possibly even doing them virtually. So if you're a property owners association or anything, we could, you know, he could work with you and, and set it up in your clubhouse and they could kind of do it a virtual meeting if that's important to for the COVID and everything restrictions there. Um, local issues as far as water quality goes, you've seen our water weekly water quality reports that we also post through the Rivers Coalition there. The water quality itself is looking good, as as Jackie iterated when you fly over. I mean, it's almost like the Bahamas out there on a flood tide. Uh, so, but unfortunately, there's a lot of missing resources. The seagrass, oysters need to be recovering. As the Diana said, we've got to keep these uh, any kind of discharges in check once we go into the spring season of spawning. So, as we get the water. Uh, 
the warmer temperatures that triggers the oyster spawning in, during the spring, along with a lot of other estuarine animals uh, that happen during the spring. So just think of spring spawning. And if you had a huge discharge event during that time, you wipe out huge generations of spotted sea trout and other kind of things that are in the water column. So we really need to um, make sure we keep on track with that. Um, but seagrass update, uh, Todd, are you on? Is Todd wanting to give any kind of, okay, he, he's not responding, but let, let me just, you can tune to his website and Todd has some excellent kind of updates and graphics on, on our seagrass from space. He's really great at uh, really reviewing all of those um, imageries that, are, that he uh, represents. Remember during uh, the algae blooms that happened to Lake Okeechobee, he was always on that. In fact, I remember 2013 when he called me and was, have you seen this? And he showed me that. And I was like, wow, great. Can we get that posted out there? You know, so um, as we've seen, uh, he also can look at the uh, seagrass areas out right inside the St. Lucie Inlet where the confluence of St. Lucie and Indian River Lagoon. Um, it's a really important area, about 400 acres uh, that we really want to recover to full seagrass um, ability there. Uh, River Keeper update. We've got a really big update, and I want to ask Mike Connor to come forward. Um, some big announcement here. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Yeah, I've been a little bit MIA lately uh, over the last month. It's good to be in the same room with people again, though, isn't it? Really, is great. I hope we're past COVID in that regard. Nothing like uh, personal engagement in a room with people. There's nothing replaces that. Um, over the last uh, couple months, I have been uh, a little bit. Uh, out of action, uh, I've had some uh, family uh, problems with health. My my mom and my mom and my dad passed ten days apart uh, two weeks ago, and uh, I'm basically working with our state right now, and I'm just so busy with it. But I wanted to, to let you know that uh, I have made a decision uh, to step down as executive director of Indian River Keeper effective June one, and I'm stepping down as a leadership board member of the RC uh, immediately. Uh, to take care of the problems, take care of what I'm dealing with right now. And uh, I'm actually going to pull up stakes. It's hard to even believe I'm saying this, but we're going to Georgia. We're moving to Hiawassee, Georgia on J uh, July 2nd. Uh, it's a place my wife and I have loved all our lives. I, I, as a little boy, I went to Hiawassee, went to the mountains with my parents. I took my kids, my previous marriage there. That was our vacation place. And I told myself, about five years ago, I'm going to be there in about five years. Well, we're going to fast forward it and we're going now. And um, and a good write up, uh, uh, TC Palm did a write up about my resignation. And in there, Jackie Thurl Lippish said, that I'm a guy that, you know, speak my mind. I, I say, I say, tell it like it is. And I want to tell you right now in Martin County, part of my decision is economic. And it's become, as everybody in this room knows, it's become prohibitively expensive to live here. And for me, I looked at the numbers and looked at it. I said, you know, I, I really have to move on to a place I can afford to live. And not to be a you know doom and gloom guy, but that is part of it, the economic part of it. But I have uh, I have relished every moment of doing this job, and uh, it's it was my predecessors Kevin Stanett, George Jones, and Marty Mom set the table for me. And if I may indulge you guys, I have a great board of directors, and I want to mention them by name right now. Okay, in the room: Merritt Matheson, Troy Brown, Jim Harder, who's not here today. Mike Glenn, Peter Hank, Diana Bolton, Shelley Thomas, Chris Shalera, Mark Dravo, and Paul Laura, who is here today. And I had a great advisory board over the years of really great scientists. So I, I called them whenever I had a chance to pick their brain and learn from them. Joe Giglio is one of them. Joe is in the room. Dr. Grant Gilmore, who has a lot to say about what's happening in these waters right now. And uh, Grant is going to come out with some information very soon on herbicides that are going to just blow your mind. And it's really something I won't indulge in here today, but I think we all know that this is uh, one of the smoking guns we have to get a handle on. Um, Zach Judd at FOS, great marine guy, knows everything about every fish, every seagrass. I called J Zach all the time, and he always called me right back and said, yeah, you're looking at this, you're looking at that. You got that's No, that's not that. This is that. And I finally learned a lot about the flora, you know, and I knew what I was talking about uh, somewhat. Not like Zach does, but I know enough to be dangerous, right? You know, so, and, uh, you know, part of my, part of my real thrust here in the community was to get the community engaged, but I, I have a real pretty good handle on the economic side of this, having been a fishing guide for quite a while. 
in Miami, I was a fishing guide. I was a magazine, magazine writer. I wrote, and I'm writing conservation stories for 27 years now. Um, I looked at the direct connection behind between resource health and the economy in Martin County and all the water users, fishing in particular. And uh, if you look at a list of my business partners, I'm going to indulge again, please indulge me. I'm going to name some business partners. You probably know a lot of these businesses. Lindsay Marine, William Lippish, Royal Surgery, White's Tackle, Renzetti Machining, Angle Coolers, Blue Current Media, Pure Fishing, Snook Nook, Bait and Tackle, River Palms Cottage and Fish Camp, DOA Lures, Zeke's Paddle Sports, Native Water Sports, Vero Tackle, <clears throat> Hardy of England, which is a large fly fishing corporation and makes fly fishing tackle, and Stuart Angler. If you look at these, about 75% of them are directly involved in fishing, okay? And basically, they, they're the low-hanging fruit on my list. When I first came to this, I wanted to get the obvious businesses that had the greatest impact and stood the to lose the most should we lose the fishing here in the estuary. And what I hope to do, I hope to do from afar is keep helping my board engage the businesses, uh, but there's a lot of room for improvement to get business. The businesses write us checks. Let's face it, they write us checks to keep the lights on for us. And it's important we keep those businesses engaged in this. And this community is growing so fast. We're going to have a lot of new businesses here, uh, water-related and non-water-related, although the word non-water-related is kind of reach because I think every business here somehow, in some way, has a bearing, a need for a clean IRL. And I really, I really believe that um, going forward. But um, uh, the good news I have for you is my successor, it didn't take long to find the right guy, Jim Moyer will be the next sector director. And I, I couldn't be happier, but I, I was just over the last three weeks scratching my head, who in the heck's gonna do this? next we got to find the right person and jim stepped up to the plate uh jim's on a schooner right now heading from key west to uh to maine uh, moving a big 87 foot boat um, i'm sure he's gonna see a whale on the way or call one to the side of the boat because he talks to whales i believe am i right <laughs> you know he's a whale whisperer but i think jim is uh jim will be uh, a, a great a great uh river keeper for you and uh, as far as I know right now, Merritt, I think everybody in the board last night, uh, no one jumped ship. So it's intact. The, bo the board is intact. Um, and a real quick comment I'll make before I, before I uh, turn it over to the next person um, is f talking about uh, the change of guardian, people coming in. Uh, I I'm in a rail house right now, and uh, we have to be out in a month, and it's all going to come together perfectly for us. But my real estate agent came in last week and asked me to do open houses. I said, sure, we'll do open houses. She brought 19 parties into my house in three hours, okay? It's a rental house up off Green River Parkway, uh, a house which my landlord offered to me to buy first, but when I heard the, uh, heard the price, I, 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 uh, I, I lost... I lost my consciousness. I almost fainted. You know, I went, you, I said, for this house, you have another house you're talking about. He goes, no, for that three, two, 1400 square foot house is $390,000. So, so I said, well, no, thanks, Jerry. You're a good guy. He said, well, if I had to rent it to you, I have to, I'd have to raise your rent $1,200 a month. And I said, well, you wouldn't have to, you know, you can, that's why. But anyway, everyone came in that house. Almost all of them were from Broward County. And most of them had, uh, half of them had real estate agents from Broward County. And my Riverkeeper truck's outside, the boat's in the garage, in the Riverkeeper all over it, all the emblems and all the business partner decals. And about three quarters of people in there said hello and asked me what I do. And I, you know, I engaged with them. The real estate agents don't want you to talk to the tenant, but we talked. And not one single person there knew what the heck Indian Riverkeeper was. Worse yet, none of them really understood what the Indian River Lagoon is. No one even knew how close it was to the house they're about to buy. No one knew about the problems it has. And that just told me, you know, these are the people, these are the folks that have good people coming up, don't get me wrong, but these folks have no clue about what we fight so hard for. So I would say the engagement has got to be really strong. We have to engage our new residents to come in because they're coming, they're coming in droves. A lot of them love to come here for the water, they don't see the water during the poor time. Just seeing it now, it's wonderful. It looks beautiful out there. But when I saw that, I realized this is a growing community that's going to double in size. It's going to happen. And we have to engage these people to help us get this thing solved. So whatever you do, 
You got new neighbors? Engage them. Let them know what you care about. Thanks. I just want to real quick as a board member of the Indian Rear Cooper, thank Mike Connor for all the effort he's put in the past almost two years now. He took the board that was in a little bit of a disarray, um, took some older board members, sought their advice, recruited some new ones. I was one of them. Um, you know, a lot of people from the northern end of the lagoon. And, and he talked about low hanging fruit that he recruited as business partners, you know, Pure Fishing, for those of you who don't know, is the parent company of Penn, Penn Tackle and Berkeley. So low hanging fruit is being a little humble with that. Um, so he's, we've really got a good foundation. You know, last night we voted on a new river keeper and he and I have worked together in my role as, as mayor of the city of Stewart. Um, you know, a lot of times the, the river keeper can say those those things that you can't say when you're in a position where you need to be politically correct. <laughs> and I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate being able to serve on that board. You know, he can say the things, you know, like, like why is there not enough water going to water conservation area three? Mike's the type of guy that I could rely on to say those things. Whereas me, I would never say that maybe knowing that that might be harmful to other communities, but he can say it and I could, pretend to say it up here when I'm talking about it. But Mike, on behalf of our entire board, thank you for all that effort you've put in for speaking your mind. And I look forward to working with you virtually and we'll be sorry to miss you, but thank you. I just wanted to say that um, in the paper, I did make the connection between business and the lagoon because that is so important. And I believe that Mike with his very classic way about him, always in a polo shirt, always with a belt and put together, you know, speaking to people really makes a difference. And also Mike, the, the writer, you know, and Mike, the showman, like in the early times, I mean, down there at like the locks or it, the, it, it, I'm sorry, I'm laughing. It's not funny, but like S308. And I mean, there he is, man. He's like down on the ground and he's like videotaping the algae and we're like forwarding it to the Army Corps of Engineers. And it was just without people, without Mike in particularly, the truth would not have been really shown to these agencies in real time. And let's just once again, give a round of applause and Godspeed to Michael. Thank you, everybody. And I, one, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, how encouraged I have been in the last two years with a vastly improved water management district board and Army Corps brass, like the gentleman next to me, Todd Polk. And that means a lot. We didn't have that luxury five, 10 years ago. We were, we were fighting a war against our own government. And now we're not, and I'm very happy about that. Thank you. All right, so we're at the end. Uh, any member comments or announcements? Any kind of meetings coming up? And again, if there are, and you, you or your organizations find something or something's coming up, please get it to Mickey and, and we can get it on the website and get it out there. So get it noticed, yes. Oh, Kasani. Oh, okay. Wow, congratulations. All right, all right, great announcement. All right, well, thank you all for participating in the organization. As Mike said, don't be engaged, don't give up, just keep fighting. Even if the water looks clean right now, we've got to keep fighting for clean water in the St. Lucie and Indian River Lagoon. Okay.